Hello and welcome back to VLGA Connect. It's the Summer Series Best Of Collection, where we're looking back at some of the most watched and most talked about episodes in our 2021 season. We're going back to October, when I had the chance to chat with Peter Katsimidis from Infrastructure Victoria about the release of their 30-year strategy, its recommendations in relation to growth area infrastructure, urban infill, and for developing of regional areas. Peter, welcome to VLGA Connect. Thanks for having me. Good to have you with us. Uh, your role as Director of Network and Planning, I'm assuming is a pretty crucial one in coming up with that vision for what you want to see happen around Victoria over the next 30 years. Correct. So in, in my team, we look at a range of issues, looking at how Victoria is growing and changing and the, and the needs of Victorians uh, are changing equally and looking at the land uses. So what, you know, what's needed in particular areas uh, from an infrastructure perspective, and that could be mo most often public transport or transport related infrastructure, but equally social infrastructure and other forms of infrastructure that can help improve the lives of uh, the Victorians and making sure that they're getting the most uh, out of the areas around them and be able to get around and um, have all the f facilities and services they need to enjoy their lives. Peter, there's a lot in this document, 94 recommendations. We're not going to go through all of them, and I want to, but I do want to come to some specific ones in a moment. But can you shed some light firstly on how you arrive at this point to have those 94 recommendations that you think are the most crucial ones for a 30 year view? Yes, yeah, so we, we look at a, a range of uh, information, including data that's uh, provided from, from government. So the demographics information, the population growth forecasts. We also liaise a lot with, uh, with stakeholders um, across the board, uh, whether it be local government, state government, uh, uh, advocacy groups, um, and really try to understand what their needs are going forward we gather a lot of that information together pull that in together and and try to um, get as many good recommendations to meet those needs going forward so we also uh, liaise a lot with the community as well and from that we developed our uh, draft strategy uh, late last year which was released we then put that out to consultation uh, and got some feedback from a range of stakeholders in the community. We then adapted some of those recommendations and released the final strategy on that basis in August this year. So there's a lot of consultation, a lot of data analysis, and equally uh, a, a lot of uh, transport modeling as well, because that's an important tool to look at how uh, people are going to move around in the future with the population growth and how that's gonna change where people live and work as well. So if you build a new transport infrastructure, that may change. Uh, the way, the shape of the state, where people choose to live. So how do you how do you match that? And it's it's an iterative process, and we try to come up with uh, the most appropriate infrastructure uh, that's required and put that to government and say this is what we believe you should be planning for and delivering over the next thirty years. And just to be clear, these are recommend recommendations to government. You're in a bit of a space now where you wait to see what the government is going to do with your recommendations, don't you? Correct. So the government's got a, about a year to respond uh, and let this let us know uh, what they agree with, they disagree with, and how they may action these items going forward. And that forms part of their, their infrastructure planning going forward. Um, and then over the next uh, few years, we'll monitor that. And again, within the next three to five years, we'll bring out another updated strategy. So we'll obviously look at what government said they're going to do, what they've done in the meantime, do some more analysis, some more consultation, some more uh, research, and update our strategy again in, in three to five years again. So it's it's a constant thing. Um, one thing that's for certain is things will change and do change, and it's important we continue to go through a process of reviewing our own recommendations, seeing what government's doing, how we fit in with that, and continue to liaise with the community and stakeholders going forward to make sure we we, we get it. Um, a, you know, an appropriate strategy again in, in three to five years' time. Recently on this program, we spoke with the CEO of Infrastructure Australia, who talked a little bit about the way the agencies work together. From, from your perspective, what comes first? Your recommendations for Victoria that need to fit into a national perspective, or do you look at the national perspective first in terms of those big picture items? We do work uh, quite collaboratively with Infrastructure Australia, we, we, we share information and, and uh, discuss uh, the various, our recommendations versus theirs, which don't always 
much fully. Mm -hmm. We do look at it squarely through a state lens, being aware, however, of the federal issues. So there's some interesting things in there, such as uh, uptake of electric vehicles. Now, obviously, this, the federal government's got an important role to play in that, but equally, um, we, we are shining a light on those issues at a state level because there are things the state can also do uh, separate from from the federal government to bring forward the uptake of electric vehicles um, going forward. It must be a really interesting sort of puzzle board to, to get all those pieces uh, aligned. Let, let's talk about some specifics in this uh, new strategy for Victoria. We've I've sort of got three broad areas I'd like to talk to you about. The growth, uh, the urban infill and the regional areas. Let's talk about growth firstly, because understandably with massive growth happening very much around the edges of the city, that's obviously taking a lot of your uh, focus on how you plan for and meet those growth projections? Correct. So despite the, the, the recent slowdown uh, in growth in Victoria, what we're still going to see is significant growth across our state going forward, in particular in Melbourne's outer suburbs and our growth areas. And that presents a lot of challenges. Um, there's a lack of infrastructure in some of these areas, and, and sometimes it can take many, many years before the infrastructure catches up with uh, what's needed by the community. So we've tried to shine a light on that from a range of areas. Uh, social infrastructure is really important. Um, there's a lot of young families there. Um, we need to make sure that people living in these areas have got the right social infrastructure to support them. So that's mm -hmm. things like aquatic centres and libraries, which at the moment, uh, these growth areas don't have many of in comparison to the established areas in Melbourne. So we want to make sure that, that the state and local governments work together and create some funding and a planning process to make sure that, that we get some of this infrastructure implemented as soon as possible. Um, also, from a, an accessibility perspective, um, many people living in these areas have got a long way to travel. Um, the, the roads and the public transport infrastructure is not keeping up with the demand. And we want to make sure that um, the right infrastructure is in place as early as possible, as quickly as possible, uh, to make sure that people have got good access to public transport and roads, and also minimises uh, their reliance on, on, on the vehicles as well. Because it, you know, if you're living in a city, you get good access to trams, buses and trains. We want to try and get as much of that uh, equal access out in the in these growth areas as well so that represents a lot of challenges but we need to plan for this so we, we, we're calling the government to put together an authority which will help prioritize and plan and monitor um, how this infrastructure has been rolled across these growth areas and we believe that's an important aspect uh, going forward. Peter do you think we can ever get to a space where the the provision of infrastructure actually is in line with growth or are we always going to be playing this sort of catch up do you think there's always going to be a challenge um and and growth has happened in victoria a lot quicker than we anticipated you know 5 10 20 years ago and that always presents a challenge uh, but that's why we believe uh, we can put in place uh, a, 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 an organization which can monitor uh, the situation and advise uh, government and put together like a program business case going forward to make sure that we are trying to keep up with this and also prioritizing where we have our growth so at the moment, rather than you know trying to grow everywhere, that perhaps we release uh, some of this a bit more uh, in a coordinated mm -hmm. way, which is already happening, but uh, it needs to be a bit more coordinated to make sure that where people are moving, that they're getting their supporting infrastructure in as soon as possible. You mentioned libraries and aquatic centres, particularly as that sort of social infrastructure that needs to, to catch up. I, th I think you've, I think I'm right in saying for the first time, you've actually recommended to government a minimum level of investment from the state towards those growth areas for those types of facilities. Why have you done that? What we're finding is that whilst with all the best intentions, there are contributions that have been put forward to these growth areas through the developers and other means, that the, 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 the expense of building uh, this social infrastructure way outweighs what, what investment is, is going into this other infrastructure. So we believe local governments need some support um, and up to about uh, initially, initially in, in the planning of the infrastructure. So help them out to make sure that they're, they're designing the best infrastructure possible. And these locations are not just libraries. They're not just aquatic centers. They have 
other services associated with them. So they really form an important centerpiece of the community. And with, with, with working with government, they can plan the best possible infrastructure they need in the, in the most appropriate locations, get some coordination happening again against, uh, across the board, and equally then get some funding support up to about a third of the, of the cost of the infrastructure to make sure that this infrastructure has been delivered sooner rather than later. Because we're seeing a lot of young families already mm. in these areas, we need to make sure that young families and any families have got the services around them um, at, when they need them, not in 20 years time. So this will, we think will, will bring a lot of this expenditure forward and the community benefits from this. Is that an example of a recommendation that's being formed through the, uh, the research and the consultation that you've done? Was it an argument that's been put forward particularly by those growth councils in this case? Yes, yeah, so we didn't actually include this recommendation in our draft strategy and we found through consultation with stakeholders in the community uh, that there was a, a real need for this. We crunched our own numbers. We looked at uh, the population forecasts in these areas, the age demographics in these areas versus the amount of infrastructure uh, that's available. And there was a, a, a significant gap if you're living in the city in, in the parts of Melbourne versus mm -hmm. living in the growth areas, you're not getting the same level of service. So we, we recognise that this is going to this this is going to grow over time. So this this gap is going to get larger. So we need to start planning immediately. And, and and get as many of these facilities implemented as possible over the next yeah. few years. So what about those inner areas? Everyone has their own frame of reference, don't they? So you've probably got people in those built existing areas uh, saying, you know, why are all the growth areas getting the attention? What about us? What do you say to those parts of Melbourne and what's in the plan for them? It's very important we get a balance because we are are growing significantly and growing into these growth areas and into peri-urban areas. And there needs to be a balance. We also need to plan for how we're going to get uh, some of this growth occurring in designated places within the established areas as well, because we simply can't just sprawl and sprawl mm -hmm. and sprawl because the problem gets larger as we move out. People need to be able to have choice and that choice doesn't need to be uh, a binary issue. I, I can only afford something in the outer suburbs, therefore, I must buy there. We need to create more more opportunities for people to choose to live uh, in the established areas, but we need to plan for that and make sure that we're getting density in the right places to make sure people got good access to jobs and services and, and make the most of the infrastructure we're, we already have in established areas. Does that also extend to filling in gaps, for example, in transport systems, etc.? Because you you often hear the argument, for example, the west of Melbourne doesn't have the same sort of public transport infrastructure that the east has had for a long, long time. Does that factor into your thinking as well? Absolutely. Uh, so that we've got some recommendations uh, in the strategy which, which looks at uh, bridging those gaps in, in, in areas that have got gaps, particularly in the western suburbs. That includes improvements to the rail line. And buses, got a, buses have got a very important role to play uh, in this process as well. Um, you can get buses out there very quickly and they can perform a very important role. So we also believe that more broadly, uh, we need to improve uh, access to everyone across across Victoria uh, to make sure that they're getting we're getting the most out of our infrastructure and giving people choices about how they move around uh, to get to their jobs and schools and wherever they need to get to. Peter, recently I had the pleasure of uh, hosting the launch of the Regional Cities Victoria Advocacy Priorities for the next few years, and part of that was a discussion with a panel that included your outgoing CEO, Michelle Maison from Infrastructure Victoria. Um, so I know that the regional areas, particularly with a big shift on, we're hearing this all around the country into regional spaces, are also um, a special case at the moment for infrastructure attention, aren't they? They are indeed. Um, and. In some respects, uh, we've we've tried to tackle regional Victoria in the same way we've tried to tackle metropolitan Melbourne, and they are very different. Uh, the densities are different. The amount of people living in these towns and 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 regional cities um, are much smaller. And we find, in particular, with public transport, the way it's operating, we're, we're actually spending um, a large proportion of our overall. Uh, public transport expenditure on regional Victoria, but we're only getting a, small, a very small fraction of, of, the, of the patronage we're getting in, in Metro Melbourne. So what that tells us is we need to look at better ways to 
uh, manage the public transport network in regional areas. There's, uh, the, you know, buses in particular, again, have got an important role to play. And this needs, we believe this needs to be a focus going forward is how we're going to give people choices uh, to best get around in these regional areas, but equally support regional Victoria with, with, with the appropriate social infrastructure as well. Things like youth foyers have also come up in our um, recommendations as well to, to really help um, address some of those issues in regional Victoria. Housing is another issue just that occurs to me, Peter, that uh, pretty much every council raises as uh, there's a shortage and a crisis. Um, what can your strategy recommend to help address that issue? Yeah, so we've, we've made some recommendations on, on social housing uh, in, in the strategy, and we, we believe that it needs to be a, a constant thing going forward across Victoria, looking at the role of social housing and making sure that they're in the right places as well, because we don't want to put social housing in places where uh, people are basically stuck where they are, they can't get around. Yeah. Uh, we need to be very careful, uh, plan appropriately, uh, give them, give social housing the the uh, be of the high high quality that's needed to ensure that uh, uh, you know people aren't socially deprived. I heard a staggering number the other day from uh, from Infrastructure Australia actually that there's a predicted shortage of housing of six hundred and seventy five thousand. Um, houses over the next 15 years, which just blows my mind. So a lot obviously needs to be done. Absolutely. And, and housing is, is, is an important issue. Our, our population will continue to grow at, at a rate of knots. And we need to plan for that accordingly because it's, it's the whole uh, kit. It's, it's, the, it's the housing itself, where it is, the type of infrastructure you have for that housing. It's the energy equation that, that comes with that to make sure that our, our new houses are as energy efficient as possible, uh, that they're well serviced by public transport. And uh, as we need to make sure that there's as much equity across the board uh, for everyone to, to enjoy the same amenity that everyone else does as well. Peter, that's been really enlightening about the Infrastructure Victoria 30 year strategy that was recent release. Just a little bit about you, if you don't mind, because some people might recognise you from a from a previous role, but uh, you've worked in Perth, in London, you're back in Melbourne, Melbourne's home for you. It is, it is home indeed. It was an interesting time to move back from, from Perth to Melbourne with the, with the pandemic. So you could never really predict these things. But yeah, so I've, I've had the luxury of, of working uh, in London and Perth for combined uh, you know, 10 years and had the pleasure of um, working on developing and planning some really amazing uh, transport infrastructure in both those cities. Uh, and more recently uh, working at, at RACV uh, doing a lot of their advocacy work there and, and looking at a, a range of issues from road safety uh, to the, the transport equation that, that, that needs to be addressed going forward. So uh, it's been you know, a, a fun career so far, really enjoy, uh, very passionate about uh, infrastructure for, for Australians and for the community. And um, I guess Infrastructure Victoria provides that equal uh, opportunity to, to be independent uh, to point out opportunities, identify opportunities to improve our community and make sure that um, we continue to grow our state um, in a way that everyone gains from it. Peter, question without notice. It occurs to me that someone who's basically made a career around transport infrastructure, Melbourne must be a pretty exciting place to be with the unprecedented level of investment in really big ticket transport um, projects that we're seeing at the moment. Melbourne and Victoria has got a, a, a global reputation of being a leader in, in transport. And that, that comes from um, the early years of, of planning our, our, our public transport network uh, to, through to the intelligent transport systems we have on our, on our motorways. And even now we're looking at how we're going to implement a road user charging scheme with government as well. So Victoria continues to lead the way in many ways. Uh, some of the challenges going forward uh, are going to be uh, the fact that our city is so large and we need to, and it's going to continue to grow uh, and how we meet those demands going forward uh, is both a challenge and, and, and exciting at the same time. Fabulous. It's been really great to speak with you, Peter, and I appreciate you giving us some of your time for VLGA Connect. All the best with the work you're doing at Infrastructure Victoria and hope to speak with you again. Thanks very much for having me, Chris. And that's the final episode in our VLGA Connect Summer Series Best Of collection. I hope over the past few weeks 
you've found it interesting to look back on some of our 2021 episodes, some of which you may not have had the chance to see the first time around. Stay tuned. There's lots more to come from VLGA Connect in 2022, and we can't wait to have you with us. Bye for now.